Triathlon, 140 miles of you, just you, blood, sweat, heart. Stand by the finish line of a triathlon and you may have to pick your jaw off the ground. Despite their exhaustion, a lot of competitors cross the finish line beaming, vibrant, seemingly high on their own accomplishment. In direct contrast to the high derived from a drug or a drink, that addiction is defined in psychological terms as an uncontrollable compulsion to repeat a behavior regardless of the consequences. To know both highs makes you lucky and unlucky, wise and forever racing. Tom Rinaldi and a man named Todd Crandall. In every race, the water cleanses him. The bike carries him. The road delivers him. Far from the life he once led. 2.4 miles in the deep lake waters, 112 miles beside the alpine slopes, 26.2 miles through ancient city streets. I'm feeling better. Iron Man Austria. And of all the competitors this day striving across an historic landscape, Todd Crandall, the tattooed 40-year-old from Ohio, has already covered much greater ground than most. The same tenacity that I put into destroying myself, I just needed to switch it and put it into repairing myself. The destruction that needed so much repair in Todd Crandall's life began early. When he was just three years old, his mother Louise, struggling with drug addiction, committed suicide. For Todd, her death left scars that only spread with time. Her leaving me just caused this big gaping wound in me and I didn't understand emotionally why I was the way I was. I wanted to know why I hated myself so much, why I felt I wasn't good enough. I assume that a good deal of him believed that he in some way was partially, if, if not totally, to blame for what she had done. To ease that pain, Crandall began drinking at 13. Three years later, he tried cocaine. The moment changed his life forever. I snorted a couple grams of cocaine in the school parking lot. And instantly, and I mean instantly, when I did that first line, I was like, that's what I've been looking for. By the time Crandall was a senior in high school and one of the best hockey players in Ohio, addiction began destroying his dreams on the rink and everywhere else. He played a game on cocaine and got caught doing cocaine on the school bus driving up to Jackson, Michigan. Not only did I kick him off a hockey team, but I just ended a relationship um, with a player that I've had a relationship with maybe for five or six years as a coach. So began a decade-long descent through liquor and cocaine, crack and heroin, jail, homelessness and despair ultimately led to thoughts of suicide. It got to the point where the difference between living and dying to me was non-existent. And I was like, I know that my destiny is to end up the way my mom did. When am I going to get there? In 1991, Terry Crandall confronted his son. Get to rehab or get out. I told my dad emphatically, yeah, I'll go, to, I'll go to rehab, but I'm not going until I'm done doing this cocaine. And if you think of taking this cocaine from me, I'll f***ing kill you, is exactly what I said to my own dad. And my dad sat there for six to eight hours, like we're having this conversation today with tears running down his face, talking to me about what it's going to be like when I'm dead. In every race, in every stage, there is a turning point for Crandall. I forgot how hard these things are, man. Oh my God. Where he can surrender to the pain. I'm tired. Or persist through it. Iron Man Austria is no different. I hope I can keep running. Each time he remembers his own turning point. It came two years after the confrontation with his father in 1993, just after his third arrest for DUI. I was drinking a beer 
roughly around noon and I distinctly remember putting that beer down and saying, that's it. This is over. I'm going to put my life back together. We never ever gave up on Todd, ever. We always believed that he would reach the point where he would end this if it didn't kill him first. Crandall quit drinking and drugs, cold turkey. He attended recovery meetings, enrolled in college, and began playing hockey again. But ultimately, he found his new focus in a passion as extreme as his addiction, the grueling pursuit of a triathlon. I was going to do the Ironman. No knowledge, nothing, but I was going to do that. Crandall trained for months, reshaping his body and redirecting his energy. He's never stopped. This is awesome, Pat. Iron Man Austria is his 13th, and as he strains through the miles, he pushes on. My legs are about to snap. Here. As he did toward that first finish line eight years ago, November 6, 1999. The first time he made it, from addict to Iron Man. He was back. He was back. He made it all the way back. That's victory. It would be simpler if the journey stopped there for Todd Crandall. In a sense, it just began. Okay, everybody, it's 7 o'clock, so uh, let's get started here. Crandall founded Racing for Recovery in 2001 as an alternative to other recovery programs. Fitness and family are cornerstones in reaching out to addicts. Building self esteem and confidence. Like Jonathan Chang who's battled cocaine for 16 years. So desperate for help, he moved to Ohio to join Crandall's program. He has been clean for seven and a half months and is in training for a triathlon. He's an inspiration, he really is, you know? I mean, he, he a lot of things he experienced very similar to mine and he's turned his life around and he's doing so many good things for so many people. Providing that hope has become Crandall's new addiction. But like his old one, it's come with great emotional and financial cost. Madison, come up by us. Come here. Clean and sober 14 years now, married with four children, his life revolves around racing for recovery's mission, often above his own family. I've lost everything. Cars repossessed house been in foreclosure three different times. I've questioned sometimes, have I done the right thing in trying to help other people? Have I lost my family? Have I sacrificed my family to help that addict? And at times, I have. Even so, he will not stop. How can you look at who I was and who I am today and not say, this is what I'm supposed to do? Coming down the last stretch past the 140th mile in Austria, Todd Crandall needs the finish line for himself and for so many others. Yeah! That's what I'm talking about, baby! Oh, man! Congratulations! An addiction, perhaps, but also a mission and a purpose to keep making that journey from addict to inspiration. That's for the addict that didn't make it last night, for the one that won't make it today, right there. Right there. He's changed his addiction to a positive addiction, and he's now used it as a platform to help others. And so he has no choice. His body's going to have to fall apart out there before he'll stop. I'm thankful to have what I have, but to sit back and do nothing with it is not the answer. Anything I can ever do for you, brother, I'm really honored. The obligation 
and the passion that I have is to take it and give it back to help someone else. Tom, thanks. Todd Crandall gave up a white-collar career to devote himself full-time to racing for recovery. His work right now taking hold in Ohio and spreading. Races are scheduled in Vegas and Idaho the next two months to raise awareness and promote positive alternatives. And we're live. Hi, this is Shira Goldberg, the host of The Addiction Show. I have with me Todd Crandall. He's phenomenal. I saw a segment about him on ESPN. He is going to share his story and what he does now, but I just wanted to give you a couple of tidbits. He's a licensed counselor in in the on the East Coast, and he um, is truly an inspiration. He's gone from an addict to a triathlete, and I can't even imagine that. So um, it's quite a, quite a stretch. Todd, thank you so much for being on the Addiction Show. Oh, this is cool. I'm really thankful to be on here to share the Racing for Recovery message. Very cool. Thanks. So I've seen a couple of your pictures. They look like they should be um, in some photography uh, like competitions. They're just so incredible. I wish I could show them here. I, I, I'll actually add those on in a little bit. But they're really amazing. So so are you. So tell us your story about where you uh, where you came from and how you switched that around. Well, like everything I do now as a counselor with working with my clients who are battling addiction and everything through racing for recovery, I, I'm, I'm the why guy. I want to know why someone became who they became. And I think that's what's a different approach now is it's more than just saying, well, I was a substance abuser and now I'm not. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know, how did I become this way? I, you know, my real mother and uncle killed themselves from addiction. As a young kid, I was totally against drugs. I thought I was going to become a professional hockey player. But because of the emotional void that I believe my mom's suicide left on me, as a young kid, I was looking for something to fill that void with. I didn't have self-esteem. I didn't have self-respect. And I was a lost kid, and I chose, and I'm a big believer in choice, I chose drugs as one way of dealing with that void. And then because of my genetic predisposition, that ignited a 13-year drug and alcohol addiction that, you know, like all of this, it, it cost me everything. And then, by the grace of God, I got my third DUI back in 1993, actually April 15th. And that was the catalyst for me to say, I don't want this anymore. I want to get better. I know I'm going to get better. How am I going to do that? And that has been the focus of myself individually and professionally um, for, well, 22 years now. It's just constantly improving physically, spiritually, emotionally, socially, intellectually, and then how do I give that back and help other people through racing for recovery? So I mentioned you're a triathlete. You live in the, well, you're East Coast for me, but you're, you're living in the Midwest. How does someone from, where, what state are you from? I'm in Ohio. Ohio. How, how does someone from Ohio end up being this world-class athlete? <laughs> Well, you know what? Um, first of all, it's kind of humbling to hear you describe me as that. And my first reaction was, and I don't mean to sound arrogant with this, it, it's easy. But bear with me. Let me explain that. And what I mean by easy was or is when I was a young kid, I was very drawn to athletics. And, and actually, I thought I was going to be a professional hockey player. So here I am, this young kid. Yes, I had some emotional traumas, but I was like, I'm going to be drug free. I'm going to be a pro hockey player. And I had my whole life planned out ahead of me. Well, obviously that got derailed, but coming into my sobriety, one of the first things I did was say, well, what did I give away during my drug addiction? And, and notice my verbiage. I didn't say what did drugs, what did drugs take from me? It's what did I give away? And I gave away a potential hockey career. 
So I immediately then said, well, I want to go pick up what I gave away. So I started playing hockey again, achieved a couple of things in that. And then I was looking for the next physical challenge. And I used to watch the Ironman Hawaii um, back during my addiction. And my mom, my stepmom, she used to be an avid runner and triathlete herself. So those two things were kind of like a catalyst or a seed that was planted back during my using years. And when I got sober, I'm like, I'm going to go, go do that. And I just picked it up and started learning about it. And to date, I've done 27 Ironmans and a couple Ultramans. And that's what how it the, happened. But there's a lot of work than that. <laughs> I'm sorry. What's the difference between an Ironman and an Ultraman? Um, an Ironman is one day where you get 17 hours to complete a 2.4 mile swim, a 112 mile bike ride, and then a 26.2 mile marathon run. So that's what an Ironman is. And like I said, I just did my 27th in Australia a couple weeks ago. The Ultraman is three days where, and you gotta, you know, kind of listen to me on this here. It gets a little lengthy. So it's three days. The first day we swim 6.2 miles and then bike 90 miles. The second day we ride 172 miles. And then the third day you run 52 miles. So you run a double marathon on day three. I can't imagine so that if someone offered me $1 million, I could not do that. <laughs> it's incredible. It's I've, seen some, I've seen some of your footage when you were when you were doing it and you look, it looked painful. Yeah. The, well, we have a, my second documentary is called running with demons that the backdrop is me participating in Ultraman Canada. And then it depicts a whole story of overcoming addiction and the, the benefits and the struggles that sobriety brings. But it, to me, I want people to look at what I do physically and then relate it to how it pertains to them with their with respect to their sobriety that it's not that i want people to say oh i have to do the iron man to achieve sobriety it's a benefit of being sober that i'm able to to utilize the iron man as one piece of my recovery puzzle now you mentioned that traditional recovery programs didn't work for you so you kind of uh, navigated your way into to creating your own. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, and I, I, I want to first and foremost say this, that I respect and endorse the uh, traditional ways of attaining and sustaining sobriety. And quite honestly, I support anything that is going to help not only individuals, but families overcome addiction. And for me, after a couple of years of doing the traditional 12-step format, I, I just was looking for something in addition to not in competition with, but I wanted more than mm -hmm. what 12 Steps offered. And that's when I started looking at this concept of, well, what does my sobriety consist of? And it consists of support group meetings, family, friends, education, spirituality, physical fitness, a social aspect. And then how do I take all these things and give them back to help other people? And actually, Racing for Recovery got started because people from the 12-step community were calling me once I started to have some uh, media highlights. People were calling and asking me, do you have a, t a different type of support group meeting that is than what is currently offered? So with Racing for Recovery meetings, we have both substance abusers and our families in one environment so that each side can learn from, support, um, educate the other side on how we not only became addicted, but how we then um, build a sober and productive lifestyle. Well, it seems to be really working for you. And I'm looking at your page right now. It says that you offer um, your own 5 and 10K run walks. Yep. Yeah, we, we, that's one of the first things I did with forming Racing for Recovery in 2001 was to implement an annual 5K run. 
I, my concept was to basically do what Race for the Cure had done for breast cancer. I was looking to do that for substance abuse and recovery. And that's where that concept came from. And, you know, this year will be our fourth annual Racing for Recovery 5K, 10K, uh, October 25th of this year. It's really amazing what you've been able to do for yourself, but I think more importantly, how you've been able to extend that and reach other people. Exactly. I, I, I want to make this, yeah. thank you for bringing that up because this isn't the Todd Crandall program. You know, <laughs> I, you know, it says racing for recovery. You know, that's the concept that I came up with because Yes, I understand my role as the spokesperson. I also understand what I do personally and professionally that may market racing for recovery, but the whole program is based on how I've been blessed with the ability to take what's happened to me, both good and bad, and turn it into a program that is, you know, saving thousands of lives. And again, I'm not saying that we're the answer to everybody's addiction problems, but We've helped a lot of people, and I'm just thankful for that. So you also um, talk a little bit about your your groups that you have. You offer those, right? Yeah, we again, we offer four unique and cutting-edge support group meetings on a weekly basis. I've gone on to get a master's degree in counseling and became licensed in two different areas to really help people understand the emotional traumas that led to a choice to use drugs and really help them heal from those traumas while we're implementing a balanced holistic lifestyle because look any one of us can quit drinking we've done that thousands of times but how do we stay stopped that's the question you know and so many times people will say well you know i keep relapsing well first of all it's not a relapse we're making a choice to use but I want to understand, well, why are you making that choice over and over and over? What, what is missing that you're still reverting back to self-destructive ways of dealing with your emotional hurts and low self-esteem? I mean, all of us are coming from backgrounds that are, let's just say, not, not the best, if you will. And I'm not putting excuses on things. It's finding valid reasons where things got off kilter. And then helping people really focus on that. And again, while we're helping them build their, their new lifestyle. Yeah, one of the analogies I use for people who are um, interested in complete abstinence, I always let them know, you know, if you take something away, you have to replace, good or bad, you have to replace it with something else. And it's, it always reminds me of, you know, when you see little kids at the beach, they dig these holes. And then the tides come in and eventually those holes are filled right back up. Yep. And I think if you're, if you, if you uh, deal with whatever issues got you there in the first place, you know, that's, that's a really good start. It's not, it's not just about stopping because most people without learning new tools or resolving old traumas, they're never really going to be able to stay stopped. Absolutely. Well said, you know, and I'm, how many times do people stop? but they're not really living what being stopped means. And you could call that a dry drunk or being miserable or whatever. I call it, you're not living what sobriety is offering to us. You know, I quit drinking because I wanted a life, not just to not drink. And that's what the first step to me is, is saying, well, I'm going to quit this and I'm not addicted to running or spirituality or education now, I am um, utilizing them and persevering through the emotional hardships in a new focused way. I'm, I'm focused on my physical fitness. I am determined educationally to improve and get better. This is about um, a new focused, productive way of living, not a new addiction. Addiction is a negative connotation. Mm -hmm. That's in the past. I'm focusing on living productively now. You have a wife. You have beautiful, uh, beautiful kids. What do they think about all of this activity with you uh, training for these 
for these major events that, and they're held worldwide. You just mentioned you came a couple weeks ago from Australia because I wanted to talk to you on the phone. You said you're on a plane from Australia. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, you know, my it's funny because my kids, you know, I have four beautiful kids. Um, they they range from the age of 16 down to nine. Um, and and awesome awesomely, if that's a word, my daughter was born five years to the day that I quit drinking. So in yeah. on Wednesday, her birthday and my sobriety day are the same same thing. But to me, um, th I think they just think that this is their dad. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny, we'll be, we'll be out somewhere and someone will come up to me and they'll may talk to me about my books or, hey, you really helped me. And, and they, they kind of make me you know, they just, they talk to me in a very kind way. And my kids are like, what's the big deal, dad? You're, you're just my dad. But having said that, they're constantly seeing their father um, take responsibility for my past, do everything I can to improve as an individual in the present and prepare for what's coming in the future. And that's what I want to show my kids that I am here by the grace of God, because I quit using drugs, I tell them all the time, you guys are only here because your dad quit using drugs. And then I want them to see through racing for recovery, the dangers of addiction and the success of sobriety. So that's the message that I'm delivering to them. And that's really well said, because that's exactly, that's exactly how it is. I mean, it, definitely you can be successful if you're in, if you're living the life of sobriety. And I always tell people too, it's not just stopping something and then resuming your your old life. It's it's a constant evolution of growth and renewal and um, it's it's the most amazing part of my life. And I'm really ex I feel really excited almost every day, not every day. <laughs> but just that I get to have this opportunity and I it wasn't given to me. I had to earn this. I had to earn this for quite a long time and that's why this show is is around because I'm always looking for amazing resources and and wonderful and ins inspirational role models like you so people can say and you're so down to earth and I, I love that I'm I'm originally from the Midwest it myself and I think we're some pretty down down home folk and um, you know, but people can really look up to you and, and you're so, you're kind of humble in all of your accomplishments. I mean, it's, it's really amazing. And I think it, it offers people a, a message that, Hey, if Todd can do it, you know, I can do it too. You know, you need to be my spokesperson. <laughs> <laughs> you used one of my favorite words and that's opportunity. Mm -hmm. And then you also used one of the three words that have kept me as I say somewhat sane for all these years, are empathy, humility, and gratitude. Mm -hmm. Those three things are the cornerstone of what I have in my life today. A absolutely. And I want to be just an example to somebody else. It's not, we're coming into sobriety with no self-esteem, no self-worth. We don't, we hate ourselves. And I want to say to that person, I'm not better than you because, you know, I haven't used drugs in a couple decades and I'm doing these physical things. I'm saying, if I can do this, so can you. It's not about, oh, you have to do the Ironman to be sober. It's saying, look what you can do in your sobriety. Mm -hmm. that, that's the Racing for Recovery slogan is with sobriety, anything is possible. Spiritually, physically, relationship-wise, um, emotionally, we can and do get better and succeed. But it's never about being better than or comparing. It's relating to and improving. You know, I was interviewed um, last year and I said that uh, I never compare myself because you're in a constant state of misery if you're comparing yourself to others and you think you're better than there's always somebody above you thinking the same thing. So it's really about just working on yourself and being, being fulfilled in, in whatever ways that that means to you. And for you, it's doing this unbelievable. I mean, this, what you do, I've met a try, try, what are they called? Triathletes? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I've met one before and 
I didn't even understand the scope. I mean, like I physically, mentally could not understand running for that many miles and training all year round. And it's just, it's just such an amazing accomplishment. And you've got your masters, you're a, also you're a licensed addiction counselor many times over with your credentials and, and you have these groups and it's just such a, such an inspiration because you're very out about your recovery and that off, that often includes sharing your story with people and, and you're able to do that because you're, a, you're also somewhat of a motivational speaker to high schools and in other areas, right? You speak, you speak about this. Yeah. And you know, you you're validating what I believe in, you know, someone can, you're, you're saying that right there. You're like, Oh my God, you know, I couldn't imagine running all these miles or doing these events. Well, I couldn't imagine when I was living in my car down in Florida being off of drugs. So it's this, it's all relative, right? I, I couldn't imagine being sober. First of all, and this is the God's honest truth. I didn't, I couldn't even imagine being alive much longer. And I know that sounds so cliche, but I just didn't care. Mm -hmm. And I figured I was going to end up the way my real mom did and was like, okay, let's get this over with, you know? And if people watch the ESPN thing, they hear my dad even talking in that regard, which is very difficult to, to see. But still, back to what my point was, it's, it's all relative. You know, I couldn't imagine having the life that I have in any capacity, not just the physical piece, the educational piece, the friendships that I have, the humility the um, spirituality that I have, none of it. I never thought I'd have any of it. So I don't want people to get hung up on what I've done physically. Yes, I hope they get inspired by it, if you will, but I want them to be inspired to do their own thing, but not look at me and go, well, God, I can't do that because, you, can. you know, I've taken a lot of my clients have gone from addict to Iron Man. You know, my, the title of my first book is called From Attic to Iron Man, and I've literally seen other people do the same thing, but that term Iron Man is applicable to anything that we want to achieve in sobriety. Well, you've really shown a lot of just so, so many, especially young people, that they are able to make changes. And, and I say that too, change is a choice, whether it's good changes or bad changes. When we first start out, these are choices that we make. And then the aftermath of addiction, you know, then it, it becomes something that's really un, truly unmanageable. But we have that, uh, we have that optimism that, hey, if I can make a bad choice, then, then it's very possible I can make a good choice. I love talking to you like this. It's refreshing. You're absolutely right. Every day we wake up, we have a choice if we're going to use or not. Mm -hmm. And if we're fortunate enough to make that cognizant choice to not use, then we get the opportunity to do whatever we want to enhance that choice. But if you make a choice to use drugs, it takes away every other opportunity to, to really live a sober life. I love that choice is my favorite word mm -hmm. in, with respect to being um, a person in sobriety. I chose this better life. I've worked my butt off to get it. And I've been able to, to get where I am with the support of a lot of people. But it starts from within, right? We have to do this for ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the people that are coming into recovery, I mean, there's thousands every day. And I, and I really feel privileged. <coughs> such a small part of some people's um, change. And I get to see them and it, it, it's like the maternal instincts kick in, you know, when I first see them until they're ready to leave the nest and, and start flying on their own, it's, I'm just so mushy about it. I, I'm like the proud mom for all these people. And, and cause it's, it's such, I, I, I'm living the life I, I wish for them. And it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing achievement, and every day I try to be grateful and, and mindful that this is where I am because I chose this life for myself. I'm gonna, I've got to send a quick text message because actually somebody's knocking on my door for their session, but they're 20 minutes early. <laughs> so give me one second here. Um, 
well, maybe they'll they'll be uh, appreciative and watch the show. Absolutely, I will. I will let that know. No, I I I concur with you a hundred percent. You know, I, again, I, you get back to that word you used: opportunity, choice, humility, empathy. Those are inspiring and motivating words, and they also reflect um, uh, accountability. You know, I'm accountable to what I have in my life today. I'm accountable for my choices and my actions, and I want that. I don't, we're not powerless over this stuff. We have complete power over it. You know, if we choose to use, then we're powerless. Right. But I'm not powerless today. I own that power, and I am thankful for that. Yeah, I'm a big advocate of, of empowerment, and that's what I. That's how I feel about myself. And it's I, if you listen to anyone's life story, it's it's absolutely phenomenal how they survived and how they were able to find themselves in sobriety and and be successful in sobriety. But every single one of us, it could be a, a major motion picture. But the common thread is we all have very similar patterns. We've come from trauma. We didn't learn communication or self-soothing skills or co life skills. And then we're kind of thrown out in the world. And, and um, a lot of people tell me, I can't believe I got here. And with, with all of those ingredients, I can't believe they can't believe it. I mean, we don't learn how to be effective as, and with our interpersonal relationships. And, and a lot of us are, are not um, proficient at being assertive, so we'll kind of either be aggressive or we'll be, um, we'll let people walk all over us. And, you know, this is definitely not the recipe for success. So as people are getting more proficient in their sobriety, then they can see, you know, and I think that really reduces their level, at least for me anyway. The more skills I learned, then I realized, you know, I wasn't a bad person. I just, I just didn't have... I wasn't aware of the choices that would that would be able to help me in a way that would be uh, so much healthier than than just numbing out and, and running and drinking or or you know or whatever anybody does. And so it's the shame and the stigma is also a, is also a very strong current. And for you to have this awesome shirt on with your logo, racing for recovery, um, it's just really putting it in the in the front lines and saying, Hey, this is what we're dealing with. And we need, we need to have these conversations. You know, what we're talking about here basically is self-esteem. Mm -hmm. If you know, look, I see thousands of people who unfortunately are hurting. Okay. And what is the bottom line is they don't value who they are. I know I didn't. You take somebody, you know, th those of us who are using drugs, are doing so because we don't value who we are. So when you begin to just say to yourself, you know what, I may not like myself the way I should, but I like myself just enough to not do anything that's gonna hurt myself today. Then you put yourself on the road to self-betterment. And if you have that same attitude every day, that's where the progression comes in. You don't, you don't walk into a support group meeting and expect to have 20 years of sobriety in your first week. I know a lot of us want that, but that's just doesn't how it works. It, it takes time and effort, the same effort that we are putting into destroying ourselves. If we switch it into bettering ourselves over time, we get better. But that's the beauty of the journey in this whole thing. It's, it's, the, it's overcoming the struggles. It's building the support system. It's giving back and helping someone else that's the rush of sustaining that sobriety. That's why I'm in this for. I love it. I really am so grateful that you were able to to come on the addiction show and share your story. And it's really an optimistic and, and hopeful presentation. And I'm, but what I really appreciate the most about you is um, that you don't have to be an Iron Man, and you said that. It's just be an Iron Man in whatever you want that, that can better yourself. I I have so enjoyed talking to you because I you get it. You understand what I'm saying behind the racing for recovery concept, and I encourage anybody 
who's battling addiction to look at racingforrecovery.org and, and just be open-minded, right? I mean, we're open-minded with respect to killing ourselves with drugs and alcohol. I mean, not everybody drank one type of alcohol or whatever. We, we'll do whatever to hurt ourselves. So if you have that open-mindedness into bettering ourselves, you'll find your way. It, I, I, I take people who are coming into my office and help them build a lifestyle that is conducive for their well-being. We have a concept here at Racing for Recovery, but it's tailor-made for each individual. It's not saying you have to do this or you'll drink again. I, I don't believe in that. I want people to say, this is what I'm interested in, this is what I'm not interested in, and start trying some things and see what works and what doesn't work. And then like you said earlier, letting them go off on their own and do their own thing. That's what being an effective counselor is, is helping people get out of your office, not keep them in. <laughs> well said. Yeah, especially if you're not psycho, psychoanalytically oriented. <laughs> you no, can let them out. I'm, I'm cognitive behavioral CBT, baby, CBT. <laughs> totally. I want to get those initials tattooed on my neck or something. CBT. I know. It sounds because like a gang. But yeah, I probably would do that. Have a, and also have a picture of like Carl Rogers, you know, like right here. Right. Right. <laughs> right. But that's yeah. it. We have to change. It, it's not people's thoughts. They're just thoughts. It's how we act with those thoughts that make the difference. Just because you're thinking of using doesn't automatically mean you have to use. Mm -hmm. It means, okay, why am I thinking about sticking a needle in my arm today when I have a wife and kids and all these things? What's going on that I'm thinking that way? And then making a positive choice to get out of that. That's accountability. That's responsibility. When someone says, oh, I, I don't know what happened. I just relapsed. I'm like, not buying it, dude. Not buying it. Won't give you that. You chose to do this. And you have to find out why you chose to make that decision. Then things get better. Yeah, well, I really, I really enjoyed our, our conversation. And uh, for more information, with, um, you can find on Todd's website. It's racingforrecovery.org. Um, and you can find his number, and he's in Ohio. So if you're if you're around there, drop by and say hello. You've been such a breath of fresh air, Todd. I really respect and admire what you're doing, and um, also just knowing that you use CBT really makes me happy. I love Aaron Beck. <laughs> hey, you know, on a side note, I'm coming to. Um I'll be coming out to L.A. Uh, at the end of December to see my favorite band, Motley Crue, play their uh, final shows out at the Staples Center the uh, 28th, 30th, and 31st of December. So I'll be out your way and would love to hook up with you and any like-minded people and, you know, meet face-to-face -face and share the message, man, you know? Yeah, well, I won't I won't be uh, buying a, con a concert ticket for that group, but... <laughs> I love it. We if can it hang out before. If it was no doubt or 30 seconds to Mars, we could talk. But, yeah, that would be great cool. to connect in person in L.A. That's one of my favorite towns. So thank you so much, Todd. Right and, uh, yeah, let's keep in touch for sure. So everyone. All right, take care. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, check Todd out, racingforrecovery.org. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.